Stephen King is the author of 54 novels. He's uh, the winner of 15 Bram Stoker Awards, the winner of the 1982 Hugo Award, five Locus Awards, the 1996 O. Henry Award, and he was, in 2003, the National Book Foundation awarded him the Medal of Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, whose uh, recipients include people like Ursula K. Le Guin, Oprah Winfrey, Ray Bradbury, and, and many, many others. Um, Peter Straub is the author of 17 novels, four poetry collections. He's the winner of two World Fantasy Awards, the 1985 Locus Award for his book, his collaboration with Stephen King, The Talisman. He's won eight Bram Stoker Awards. And uh, Emma Straub, his daughter, is uh, she's a former book court employee. She's uh, the New York Times bestselling author of The Vacationers, Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures, and Other People We Married. She's written for Vogue, New York Magazine, Tin House, The New York Times, Good Housekeeping, and The Paris Review Daily. Owen King is uh, the author of double, the novel Double Feature, two short story collections, Who Can Save Us Now, and We're All In This Together, as well as forthcoming the September intro to The Alien Invasion. He's the winner of a John Gardner Award, and our moderator tonight is the books editor for BuzzFeed Book, Isaac Fitzgerald. Without further ado, please welcome our guests. Hey guys, thank you so much for coming. First off, let's give it up for Book Court. Always got to support your bookstore. And let's give it up for St. Francis College for hosting us. Excellent. Uh, we can't thank you enough for coming out tonight. Um, so I want to get started with a question that's uh, a rather all-encompassing. Um, but looking at, uh, at these incredible talents here, uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, to, to forget that they're also all family. Um, so I was wondering, maybe down the line or whoever wants to grab it first, uh, the ways in which you've been influenced um, by the other writers in your family, um, and then also kind of, and, and especially like by your parents, but then also the ways in which you've been influenced uh, by your children. Yeah, I want to know. I want to know that question. I feel like we probably get that question a lot, but I think I think that they should they should have to talk about how we have influenced their careers. Yeah. As writers. <laughs> Oh, this, this whole thing is a little bit like a Jerry Springer episode, isn't it? <laughs> writers whose children grow up to be writers. <laughs> Pretty soon we'll throw the chairs and uh, you know, st the stripper will come out or something. You know? uh, I have um, three kids, and uh, two of them are novelists. And uh, we, we basically share our material back and forth. Um, Owen has, was invaluable on Mr. Mercedes and a book, uh, Finders Keepers, which are coming out in June. They make wonderful presents, so uh, I'd buy two copies each. Of that. No, and uh, Owen and his wife Kelly, who's also a novelist, were terrific help on those books. And uh, my son Joe... Uh, just <laughs> sent me an email y yesterday and said he's got a, a novel that he's finished called The Fireman and he said uh, that her his editor decided that maybe instead of starting in medias race in, you know in the middle of things to tell the story a straight line and he said I think it really works dad can I send you the first 150 pages and see what you think and I'm like cool that's a really cool idea I want to see what it looks like from you know a mechanics point of view in a way it's like it's like he's saying I worked on this car can I bring it in and you put it up on your lift and see what it looks like underneath to you <coughs> and because we think the same way I'm crazy about that idea and they they don't do it as much for me uh, as they used to because I've been doing this all their lives and they're kind of bored with my shit but uh, <laughs> but I, I learn a lot for them from them Emma and I did collaborate on a, on a story that I really, I did my best to urge in the direction of a novel and wound up being kind of a short novella. And I believe what I learned from Emma in that case was that um, a kind of brevity works, you know, and um, that uh, it isn't 
necessary always to fill in all the subsidiary levels at the third level and to uh, t explain about everybody's grandparents, which is one of my tendencies. Um, uh, the other thing I have, uh, is, is, this is nothing really I've learned from it, but, but, but something I have observed in Emma that for which I'm very grateful, and that is that Emma doesn't at all mind to work. She, uh, she knows that you have to put in the time. <laughs> and I, I, I was very moved one day when uh, er, early in her writing career, she came, she and her husband were at our house and um, it got to be like six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock and then we'd already had whatever it was. We were going to eat and Emma said, oh, I have to go home now. I still have to write two more pages. And I thought, my daughter, <laughs> there we go. I mean, she knew what she had to do that day and what she had to do that week. And uh, so I guess one thing I've learned is my method was transmitted pretty well. Um, I, I, I wish I followed my own method that you know so well anymore. But um, I, you know, I, I, in general, if I learned anything, uh, it's, it's kind of an appreciation of the act of writing because it's easy to get uh, so accustomed to it, and to see it uh, pop up in Emma and express itself so beautifully um, helps make me aware of all that again, even more aware, I should say. I, I think there's so many things uh, I picked up from my father over the years. Um, love of so many kinds of, of, of stories, but I think the, the biggest thing was just, I remember at some point when I was a kid, um, I, I remember thinking, wow, my dad's job, he goes upstairs and he, closes the door and he listens to the Ramones for like eight hours. And, uh, and I remember thinking, well, this is a good gig. Um, but then, uh, you know, when you realize that he does it seven days a week, um, <laughs> and it's almost always rocket to Russia, you realize this actually is a very hard job <laughs> to, to go in and do it day after day after day. And so, you know, it was a big advantage to, um, to come away with the idea that, uh, that, that writing is a good way to make a living, um, but I definitely had a sobering idea of how much work it goes, uh, it takes to write a novel uh, day after day after day uh, pretty early on. I, I think that was a big help. Yeah. yeah, me too, me too. I mean, I think, um, I don't know about you, Owen, but like especially, when I was in my 20s and, and then in graduate school, so many writers I encountered um, were people who were, just had the most romantic ideas about how it all worked, um, where that involved a lot of whiskey and like staying up until four o'clock in the morning and it's like, oh God, I just can't. And, and I, I just thought, that's so dumb. That's so dumb. That's right. so not how it works. You have no idea. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe it does work for those people, but for me, it, it is exactly as you said that I I knew from the get go that it was actually a real job, and that the the sooner that I treated it that way, the more likely it was for it to actually be my job. And and that's why I think I held off for a long time. You know, through my high school years, I wasn't sure it was something I really wanted to yeah. do because I saw how much hard work yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah me too. I, I was going to be a poet because that seemed so much easier. <laughs> going after the money. <laughs> I wanted to be a poet when I started because I, I looked at novels and I thought, I don't want to do all that typing. <laughs> Look, it's like 400 pages, one letter at a time. And, and if you're a poet, you, you know, you can do like three lines here and three lines here and three lines there and you're done. And I thought it'd be easy to type that up over and over, you know. So it was an idea of efficiency, uh, I guess. I just have to ask, Owen, what did you want to be? When I was a kid? What did, yeah. Yeah. What did I want to be? Uh, I wanted to play right field for the Red Sox. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. Briefly, a bear. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so you were talking about collaborating on a story, and I would love to talk a little bit more. Um, obviously, everyone here uh, has collaborated in some some form or another, um, but I would love to talk, uh, especially your history of collaboration, um, the collaboration of this story. Yes, you and uh, you and Stephen. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about how that came about, 
And uh, oh, sure. Um, it, uh, Steve and I uh, ch chose to collaborate very early on in our fr friendship, uh, and we made this uh, fateful decision late one night, the first time you ever came to our house in Crouch End, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, there had been other people in the room, several small children, at least one woman, and all these other people had cleared off, <laughs> leaving <laughs> us in possession of a great many beer bottles. And somehow, uh, over the landscape of beer bottles, also a huge amount of cigarette ashes in the ash, because we will smoke like crazy. Huh? Um, Stevie l looked at me and said, you know what would be fun, Peter? And I said, no, thinking, whatever it is, it's got to be good. He said, uh, <laughs> we should write a book together. And I thought for a moment, I said, oh, yeah, you bet we should. So then we, the first thing we did was to figure out when we could do it. Because his uh, contracts in existence, and my contracts in existence, and his speed of writing versus my speed of writing. And it turned out that he had two books <laughs> to write. You had four books to write, and I had two books to write. So we said, okay, we'll do it in two years. And uh, we shook hands, and um, before long, we were writing a spinning machine. Yeah. Uh we said, uh, let's let's work out a, a like a I guess what they call now in the TV business a Bible. Yeah. We sat down. Uh, we smoked a lot of cigarettes. We drank a lot of drinks, and we whomped up this storyline about this boy named Jack Sawyer, and uh, we talked a little bit about quests, the quest novel. Yeah. But for me, I don't think it's real good to think about big thematic ideas before you start. But it's nice to have a little bit of a spine that you can put things to. And I said, well, here's this Lord of the Rings where it's this big, long quest to get rid of something. You know, there's Sam, Gamgee, and uh, Frodo mm -hmm. and their co company. They go to Mordor to throw these rings into the cracks of doom. I said, what if it was a story where instead of uh, to go and get rid of, it was to go and get and bring back, you know? And so we just spun it out from there, and then we just took turns. We hit it back and forth like a tennis ball. Yeah. And we're in the middle of a sentence, but sometimes in the middle of a paragraph. Sometimes, yeah. W w was it different the second time? Yeah. Yes, it was. Uh, we were more relaxed. For one thing, we weren't as young. The first time around, we'd been in our 40s. What, what year was the first time, and what year was the second time? The first one was published in 84. The second one was published in 2011. Um, not a very good year for publishing. No, it was 2001. 2001, I'm sorry. <laughs> that very bad year. And um, so like 14 years, whatever, had passed. Um, the second time, as I was saying, I think we were in general more relaxed. There was no spirit of competition at all the second time. And we just kind of cheered each other on. And um, it flowed out. It was uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it was, and I oh, one memory that I have that's very very clear was uh, Peter said to me, "When people read this book, I don't want them to be able to point here and say you wrote this, or point there and say I wrote this." And we made an effort. Actually, we made an effort to copy each other's style. Yeah. As a result of that, we met somewhere in the middle and yeah. created a third persona. Yeah, it worked. But let's let the kids talk. Yeah, well, I was going to say, on to the kids. Um, both come in from writerly families, um, but you choose to write a book about Hollywood. Um, so where do you think the inspiration for that came from? What, uh, what drove you uh, to tackle that world, a world in which... Still writerly, but something that you were not growing up growing up in. Yeah, well, uh, for me, I I had already published um, my collection of stories, which were mostly about women, sort of like me, hmm. I, or or women who could have been like me, or you know, young people, sort of New Yorkers who found themselves in the middle of Wisconsin. I don't. It was like very much like my own life. And I was so sick of it. And I didn't want to read one more book that had anything to do with New York City. I hated 
everyone. I hated every like twenty year old writer who wrote a book that took place in Brooklyn. I just like I was just it just like it it was just like killing me, just the idea of all of those books and I just couldn't write one of those. You hated all um, your friends. I hated all my friends. <laughs> no, I just I I just it was just like I... It really is Jerry Springer. Yeah. <laughs> I just felt like I was at the bottom of this like avalanche of books about New York City and about Brooklyn in particular. And I just um, wanted to go as far away from myself as I could. And it turns out I could only get about, uh, you know, 3,000 miles. And I, and I got to California. Um, and I wrote a story about this woman um, who was an actress in the Hollywood studio system and... I just loved it. I lo I'd never done research before, and it was so much fun. I had no idea. I would have done so much better in school mm -hmm. if I had realized that you could actually write about things that you just thought were cool and wanted to know about. Um, I never knew that, which is, I don't know, why I was just writing poems about boys and not writing <laughs> essays about other things that were interesting to me in addition to boys. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I love the movies. I've always loved the movies. And um, I, I think, oh, and you'd probably agree that like one of the really, really fun things about writing a book about Hollywood is that you have to do a lot of research, and that means watching a lot of movies. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That that was um, I, I had uh, I wrote my first book, uh, and it was it had a lot to do with organized labor, and I'd done a lot of research about that, and then I tried to write another book about. Um, uh, Chernobyl, and uh, I ran into some problems, like never having been there and not speaking <laughs> Russian, and um, it's just one thing after another made me realize it was totally impossible. And uh, and I'd had this idea uh, kicking around about a about a, a sort of uh, naive young filmmaker who who makes a movie and loses control of it for crazy reasons, and. Um, to write that book was much, much easier than the other two things that I'd done, or the one thing that I'd done and the one thing I tried to do, because it was the the research was, uh, for the most part, purely pleasurable. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that's a little bit of a lesson is that, you know, you have to do a certain amount of research to write just about anything, but it really helps if it's something that you would be interested in, even if you weren't writing about it. My my next book is about cheese. And that's cheese? not the one I'm working. The, the next one is, it, but it's about cheese, and that's exactly why. Because I'm like, you know, what would be really fun? Is it a learning a lot about cheese? But not about like cheese makers about or cheese makers. Yeah. Interesting. Does that mean you have to make your own cheese? Probably. Eat a lot of cheese. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what's your favorite kind of cheese? <laughs> I was just gonna ask her that. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's Munster. What's yours? <laughs> Oh, man. See, it's, I, I haven't done the, the necessary research yet. I have many different, in, in, in every category, I think I probably have a favorite, but, you know, um, something orange. Um. <laughs> I didn't even know there were categories of yeah. cheese. It's a Gouda. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, now, having started families yourselves, I would love it. I think a lot of us here, uh, finding the time to write can always be difficult, and the idea of finding the time to write when you have uh, a family, or especially when you have, like, kids. Uh, running around um, and I was wondering if you have any tips to share uh, with those writers in the audience who are maybe trying to make their time find their time while also uh, being a part of a family I accept any and all tips <laughs> I have no tips do you have tips Owen you just have to clear I mean you have to use the time that you have to write that's it's a not much of a tip, is it? It's just a I don't, fact. I don't have That's a all tip. there is. Yeah. I don't have a tip, but I have a story. <laughs> and uh, I did a thing for charity uh, at Radio City Music Hall with uh, John Irving and J.K. Rowling. Mm. And at that time, Harry Potter was the hottest thing in the entire universe, and she'd published six of those books, and she was working on the seventh. And her charity was Doctors Without Borders, and mine was Haven Foundation, which is for freelance writers who don't have any insurance and that sort of thing that fall down and can't get up and need some help uh, because we live in this country uh, where the uh, government is just so fucking uncaring about the arts that, uh, you know, we can go hang. Now, there are other countries that actually, never mind, I'm getting, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Joe Rowling was 
on Long Island, and she was under tremendous pressure from the entire world mm. uh, to finish this last Harry Potter book. She had two kids. She'd agreed to do this, uh, this uh, fundraising event in Radio City, and there was a, a sound check before, and I showed up, and uh, John showed up, and Joe came in, and she was, you know, dressed for the beach because she'd had a bunch of stuff to do with her kids, you know, that they'd had to do, and they'd had to put stuff away, and they'd gotten a slap-up meal, you know what I'm saying? And then she just put on these clogs, and she came in, she's wearing a sleeveless top and capri pants, huh. and her hair's done up in a horsetail. She looked like any young mother in the world with two kids who's also trying to work a job, you know. Right. And right away, uh, and, and I think there's a publicist from my publisher in the audience, but right away, the publicist from her company, Scholastic Books, grabbed her and took her aside, and Joe was very nice, and they talked for maybe five minutes. Uh. And when she came back, she was fucking rip shit. Uh. You know, she was in a quiet, British, well-bred way. <laughs> and she came up to me, and if you write, if, you write, if you're serious about your job, you'll know exactly what she meant when she said to me, they don't understand what we do, do they? <laughs> and I said, no, they don't. No. They don't have any clue about what we do. And the same thing is true of your children, your, 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 your spouse, your, your in-law. Well, my spouse is a little bit different because she writes as well. Yeah. And, and Owen's spouse is a terrific writer. So sometimes people do understand. But the world at large, that includes publishers, editors, uh, journalists, the people who want autographs, none of them understand what the job really is. And so mm -hmm. you have to be brutal to cut out that time sometimes. Amen, hey, umbrella. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember never, ever feeling bad about interrupting my father when he was working. That is true. Which I, someone I, never <laughs> cared. <laughs> there it is. Which and I feel never respected little. that particular boundary. And oh, my kids didn't either. Uh, I, was yeah, just I, I never felt bad about that, for, for what it's worth. I never, yeah. felt, never felt like, you know, but you could tell when dad was working, you know. I mean, you'd come in, you ask the question, and he'd tell you the answer, and then <laughs> he'd go back to work, you know. That was uh, the question like. sometimes, can I have $5, you know. <laughs> Anything, just go away. <laughs> there, is a, there is a wonderful picture that used to hang in my office of uh, me at a desk. I was writing a book called Floating Dragon. In those days, I, I was still writing with pencil and big uh, bound journals. And so I'm doing this, looking a little glum like this writing. And underneath me, beneath the desk but visible, is the squalling little girl who's, who's outraged and uh, injured in some obscure way. And I am desperately not paying attention. <laughs> I think somebody kill this child for me, please. <laughs> or at least erase her momentarily. <coughs> It's a tender moment, Emma. Yeah, uh, I, I, Such fond I, memories. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I remember it fondly. At also. least there's a picture of it. Now <laughs> uh, then Emma says, don't you have any pictures of me being happy? Yeah, there are. I mean, I think this, this also comes from being like the baby in the family. I don't know if this is true for you also, Owen, where like there are like 700 pictures of my <laughs> older brother as like a baby, like sleeping beautifully. And then like, all the like pictures and especially home videos of me I am I'm like crying in the corner <laughs> and I'm like covered in bruises covered and bruises. nobody's paying attention to me <laughs> Emma Emma's mom Susie just recently sent me a photo that shows me my dad and half of Emma's face yeah. in the in the side of the thing and she's she's a baby too yeah, in the thing yeah. way cuter than I am yeah, no, and didn't, she's carved it, right out didn't matter didn't matter yeah so you're talking about listening to your dad. Uh, I'm sorry, your dad listening to the Ramones playing. And so, like, obviously you, you had an idea of what they were doing. But speaking to, to Stephen's story about the world really knowing what they do, um, I would like to ask, do you, have, do you have a memory of kind of when, maybe even after you became writers yourselves, but when you really actually understood uh, what they did? And actually, I'd like to ask the parents as well afterwards, was there a moment when you realized that they were really on the same path? I just remember as a kid, you know, the my dad had one of those old, uh, it was a Wang computer, yeah. you know, and he hammers the keys, and the keys would just go all day long underneath the music. And, uh, you know, I think at some point it just sunk in. It's like, wow, he just writes all day. Um, so. And the knowledge of what that meant, like what that 
like was it when you started constant, writing constant labor is what it meant yeah. but i think it, you know when i was like uh third grade or something like that probably sunk in i think um i i always had a good deal of faith in emma um it never occurred to me when she was uh, even in high school that she had any ideas at all about become, becoming a novelist or being a novelist uh, because uh, she never uh, chose to share that with me, and maybe not with anybody. Um, but after, in, in, in college, she studied writing. She took creative writing with a very, very good writer named Dan Sean, whose, whose work I love, and he was crazy about Emma. And immediately after that, she, she was writing her first novel that she'd been talking about for, for a good deal. It was... Uh, based on Wuthering Heights, and it was set in Greenwich Village, and almost all the characters were high school students. And so I was of two minds about this, actually. But then she uh, gave me the manuscript, and this is the moment that we're talking about. I looked at this book, and I started to read it, and I thought, God damn, Emma can write. <laughs> you know, look at this, look at this sentence, man. I, I got no worries. Uh, Emma's gonna be able to carry the ball as far as she wants to. And the sentence, I've never forgotten this, the sentence that really bowled me off my little chair was uh, it, it was depicting a, a huge alcoholic uh, high school party in this very, very fancy uh, Greenwich Village townhouse. And somebody's playing a piano, I think, and one of the girls, or let us say young women, in, in the cast is lying across the top of the piano. And the, the sentence that I particularly liked was, she looked like a hood ornament. I thought, holy Christ. <laughs> that's really good. I mean, that, that says it all. And uh, so I predicted to Emma she was going to make about a million dollars from this book. But um, it failed to find a home. I made zero dollars. made that. zero from it. <laughs> but what a, what a memory, though. What a touching memory. No, and it was, I mean, it was really nice. Like, I wish that I still had... Um, this message that my dad left me on my on my phone uh -huh. after he read it um i i mean i could swear that he said that he thought it was going to sell for three hundred thousand dollars he says he said it was going to sell for nine hundred thousand dollars either way it's a whole lot of money that i did not make um <laughs> but but it was i mean it, it just it meant the world to me that he that he not only i mean he read it it was it was pretty big. I mean, I think it was about 400 pages. It was pretty big, and he he read it immediately. I think he called me 24 hours after I gave it to him. You know, I mean, it was immediate. Um, yeah, and it just it made me feel great. And I, I think that that, um, I, I think, you know, I, I grew up, I think, like Owen, you know, with parents who were always very supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it did, it meant a lot to to have that support not be for something sort of theoretical. You know, it was like, here, like this, I, I made this thing. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Tell me actually what you think about the thing. Mm -hmm. And that he, he liked that too, not just the idea of me wanting to be a writer. Yeah. Do you have a memory of kind of when you realized, like when you think you had a better understanding of his craft? When you knew like not just, oh, dad's a writer, but what it me what it really meant? No, I mean, I think I still have those moments all the time. Like I, I mean, as my life changes, I mean, before I had kid, before I had a kid, I think I understood what it was like in a certain way. And then my husband just walked in. It's nice. Um, <laughs> oh, there he is. There he is. Um, yeah, but then I don't know. I mean, I, I think I understand it differently all the time. Like that with every book I write, I think I understand it a little bit more that, um, you know, it, it's sort of like doing any sort of extreme sport or something where you're huh. like, no, like, I understand how to do this trick. And then you're like, oh, God, no, there's that trick. But then, like, you really want to do that trick. And you just have to keep learning new skills and um, getting better. And that's, I'm still learning. I'm still learning. Stephen, was there a moment for you and Owen when you're like, oh, this might be the, this might be the calling, what he's going to do? Well, yeah, um, there was a story that Owen wrote, and I can't remember the name of it now, but it had to do with the death house in Stark in Florida. We were actually on a road trip, and he 
<laughs> kind of sketched in the idea of what it was going to be like. What's the name of the story? It's in We're All in This Together. It's called My Second Wife. My Second Wife. And uh, when I saw the story, I said to myself, there's really something going on here. And, uh, you know, I, I want to back up a little bit and just say that uh, I never understood in my life the idea that uh, so-and-so wants their sons or daughters to follow in the family business. That that concept is foreign to my nature. Yeah. I think that kids should be allowed to do what it is that they feel the most happy about doing. And I'm, I'm no hippy-dippy. We were... We were um, strict with the kids to the sense that we wanted them to do well in school. We felt that it was important that they should uh, study, that they should do well and prepare to live a life because we tried to teach them that learning is great for its own sake. But otherwise, man, they grew up in a house that uh, always had books in it and we always read to them. And I think that that environment alone was part of the reason why. Owen can speak to that more. I'll say one other thing about Owen. Uh, he read uh, cogently and uh, wrote cogently before uh, either of my two older kids. Uh, he was the only one who never got Sesame Street uh, because we lived way out in the uh, boondocks and we only got one TV station and that wasn't it. <laughs> so that he had a tendency more to gravitate toward programs like Scooby-Doo and uh, I'm trying to think of other shows at that time that weren't so broken up and stuttery with little tiny, you know, uh, bits of information so that he seemed to get that sooner. But, you know, there's also this story about that, that uh, one of the folkies tells about Bob Dylan saying that, that he was in New York City and playing around the clubs and everything and he was just another folk singer. And then he went to uh, Minnesota and when he came back he was Bob Dylan. Uh -huh. And Owen wrote stories through college, and his brother Joe, who writes as Joe Hill, wrote stories going through college. And with both of them, there came a time, at least to my mind, when there was a kind of critical quantum jump from good to great. That's it. From being to the, uh, uh, like, anybody can write stories in high school and they get A's and may, all that, but all at once, you know, Owen did this book, We're All in This Together, and I read that story, and I said pretty much, you know, what Peter said is, this is just amazingly good stuff, and he's continued to grow, that arc has continued to grow, because I think what Emma said was true, too, you know, you continue to learn, you have to continue to learn, uh, or otherwise you just dig a rut and furnish it. <laughs> there is a uh, moment that I remember from the King household, when uh, both your boys were uh, rather small, that, that that looked to me like if not if you weren't consciously training your children to be novelists, uh, you you were at least teaching them how, how how to move story across a board. And what it was, you, do you remember this? There was a kind of a grid, and it had roads on it. And you said, okay, now the character is coming up here. What does he do next? And, and Owen would say something, and Steve would say, well, that's a really good idea. So he'll come over here, and, and I thought, oh, my God, this is a great thing to do with your children. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really, it gets right down to the red meat right away. <laughs> Beautiful. I, I was just going to say that when, one of the big things for me, I, I always forget about this, but it was, it was so, such a big part of my life, is when I was a kid, my dad used to hire me to read uh, yeah. books on tape to him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that, was, that was my that was like my my job and how I got money was I read, the book tell the books you read on I would tape. read books on tape so I would read like uh, you know a Dean Koontz book on you know and I'd have my tape recorder <laughs> and then I'd read like a Larry Block book or uh, I mean I read a million things you know best fantasy 1984 and <laughs> um, you know and this went on for years and years and years and there, so long that there was inflation tell them about how you used to do kidnapped Oh yeah, and I would do. I also did accents, and especially if the book was, if the book was. I love Kidnap. We read that as a family. But I remember uh, uh, he he hired me to do uh, to do Dune, and I think I, I think I was. Oh God, that was so I was, funny. I was busy. Uh, I was busy taping Dune for like the better part of two years or something like that, and uh, and I, I was I was. Can you remember any? I hated I hated so I hated up. Dune so much. I hated and I, Dune. 
and I would make uh, I would make certain characters speak in really you know high pitched voices just to sort of <laughs> amuse myself, and it was totally probably pretty unlistenable. But um, uh, how much did you get paid for doing that? I th- I think when I started, I got paid like nine dollars for a sixty minute tape, and I think I think by the time I finished, I was making like. You know, 20 bucks for a 120 minute tape. A <laughs> twisted <laughs> thing. God, sometimes I just have to kiss myself, I'll tell you. But, uh, when, when our daughter Naomi was like 11 or 12, I got her to read Raven, the story of the Jonestown Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> that was so twisted, but she did a great job. <laughs> did, she, did she get a raise yeah. after reading such a bloody book? <laughs> I I love that Steve though that you're like no I like I had no interest in like a family business but you like were like running such a serious training camp. Yeah. And all I wanted was stuff. No, listen, that's not true. I, <laughs> I got my kids to read stuff. It was just it was pure self interest. I got them. Yeah. They were like slave labor. <laughs> they were in the house. They were and like at that slaves. time. It wasn't like today where you could get anything on Audible.com. It was a it was a fledgling nascent. The, the first audio book I ever heard was when you know Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers, and I was making a movie in Pittsburgh, and I drove back and forth, and I found this wonderful book on tape called The Thornbirds, and I thought this is great, but there was so much you couldn't get, and what I wanted to hear that I couldn't get, I got my kids to read. I actually I read War and Peace for him. <laughs> what? I did, yeah. And I actually, I did that as an adult. It was a gift. But I've actually reclaimed all the tapes so that no one will ever hear my pronunciations. <laughs> you know what? That's that a hard took, one. That took Owen so long that he started on cassette and finished, and it finished it on, on CD. CD. That's right, yeah. Uh, of, of all the books that I've, I've written, I, I guess the one, I mean, as Steve indicated, it's, you don't really want to do this much. But I, am, um, I do like a, a novel I wrote called The Throat which is, it was originally 1,500 pages in TypeScript, and it's about an 800-page book. Um, and it's just, it's, to me, it seems really well-made, and there's a lot of great stuff in it. And uh, I think uh, it's an, an interesting take on, on the detective story. It isn't like any others that I know of, and uh, it, was, it was a real adventure. And it took a long time to do Except toward the end, it sped up. Then I was writing 20 pages a day. It was so much fun. Yeah. I haven't written that many books. No, so, it's, it's not. I'm <laughs> gonna say, good, I, good place to plug, though. Good place to plug. I think, uh, you know, I'm, my book was the hardest thing, so I like that the best. But I wrote, I wrote a short story for a, a journal called One Story. Yeah. Uh, a story called The Cure that I think is, in some ways, my favorite thing that I've written. I think about that story a lot. I think that's. I love that Thanks. story. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess The Vacationers is my favorite just because I wrote it um, sort of in like a fugue state because I was pregnant the whole time. And I don't know. I just like I, I don't really remember doing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I definitely thought it was good. terrible the whole time. And then I looked at it when I was in it and I was like, oh, that's funny. I like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. which is which was a nice feeling. So I say that one. Yeah, I'm working on a novel called um, now it's called The Way It Went Down. And I've been working on it for like three or four years, and it, it evolves a bit and uh, withdraws and contracts. But uh, I'm, I like it a lot, and uh, I'm going to keep on going. I know it has a wonderful finish, at least it looks good to me now. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do a selected stories, a uh, big uh, book with a lot of stuff in it uh, to be published next April, pr- probably. And uh, I have got a book coming out that's called Finders Keepers, which is the second of a trilogy of detective novels, really, about this guy named Bill Hodges, a retired uh, policeman. Um, And I'm trying to finish up now the third one, which is called The Suicide Prince. Hmm. And uh, I've got a book of short stories coming out uh, in probably November that's called The Bazaar of Bad Dreams. Big book. uh, Hmm. A lot of stories that have either seen print in limited locations or some of them haven't been published at all so I'm excited about that. I'm on page 247 of <laughs> my of a new novel that does take place in Brooklyn. It like I really didn't want to do it and then it just happened. Um so I'm going for it. It's in Ditmas Park though so it's like houses so it doesn't feel that's how I uh. justify it to myself. Um 
yeah, I don't know. I'm having a great time at the moment. A lot of people are having sex. Um, yeah. And I have no title. I have no title, but there are a lot of people having sex, so it's like good news, bad news. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have a graphic novel I co-wrote with my friend Mark Poirier, which is coming out in September, and it's called hey. Intro to Alien Invasion. And it's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of like a... It's sort of like a science fiction movie crossed with a indie romantic comedy. Um, so I'm excited about that, and uh, I'm working on a, a few other things. Uh, I've been working on a TV project for a while, which I actually think I'm... This is going to sound lame, but like contractually obligated to not talk about. But that's been that's been the big thing for a while. But I'm also working on a on a new book and seeing where that goes. It's a great idea. I don't want to. I could tell you what the idea is, but I'd have to kill you. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. Here's, here's the thing: we wrote the Talisman. We had a great time, didn't we, Peter? And then we wrote Black House, which is the the, the second one, and we had a great time doing that. But yeah. we always knew that it wasn't done that we had left uh some things that needed to be finished and so for a long time you know you 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 just kind of float along and time gets away from you a little bit and finally peter got in touch with me and he sent me this i'm not even gonna go into the story or anything like that but i am gonna say this he sent me this wonderful book that set my imagination Uh, on fire it's called redheaded peckerwood and it's it's like a photographic uh impressionistic thing about Charles Starkweather who went on a rampage with his girlfriend Carol Ann Fugate <laughs> in 1956 or 1957 uh-huh. and uh, he said uh, we can we can use this and this can be a motor so yeah. well, so that see. would be the title? No, <laughs> Redhead Pecker would be a great title though. I was thinking <laughs> what's this uh, great phrase a girl, a car and a gun. Yeah. There we go. That's the American dream for you. <laughs> Um, so All right, next question. Um, so I'm in college, and a lot of my friends are here. And one thing that I realize is that you guys are, there's a difference, like there's people who do a job, and then there's people who are passionate about their job. It seems like all of you guys are very passionate. And for college students, a lot of us are consumed by the idea of being great, but not about loving our work. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to know about your experiences in that because it seems like in all of your writings and even the stories that you told, you remain passionate. And so what is your best advice for college students to remain passionate and not just be like, I need to be the best because you'll never be the best if if you're thinking that way. Um, Thanks. I mean, this I don't know if this answers the question really, but just in, in terms of jobs, like, I mean, my one of the things that drives me crazy about my father Um, that I will just tell this intimate group of people, is that he's never really had another job. He taught, he taught English at his high school for one, one year? How many years? Three years. Excuse me, for three whole years. Um, I was carried through the halls. Oh, they loved him. They loved him. (laughs) Right, but, 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 (laughs) he's, let let him have his, like, little Dead Poet Society, like, moment over there. (laughs) But I, um... I, I've, I've had a lot of jobs. <laughs> I've had a lot of jobs. Some not for very long periods of time, but some jobs, I, like I was a personal assistant to a musician for four <laughs> years. I worked at, at Book Court, the bookstore that is putting on this event for another four years. Um, I think I think that, and like I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I don't know. I also really found pleasure in having other jobs that I also got a lot of pleasure out of like that it, it that it's it's not for me it it's been really helpful and invigorating especially the bookstore job to have a like a place where I could go where I could talk to people about my passion for what I was doing and about mm. books um, because it can, it's it's really lonely to be a writer, and I think that's probably true for other professions as well. That like even if it's something you're really excited about, it's hard to sometimes just like sit in your own room and just be excited by yourself. I mean, email I guess makes that a lot easier, where you can just like send your friend something, a link to something, and be like, "Isn't this cool?" Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it's it's also been really nice to get out into the world and to have other jobs that aren't my career. Um, but that are really satisfying and that definitely add things to my career. So I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. I guess to to be passionate about a lot of things and to be excited about 
whatever it is you're doing, even if it's not like your official career path. Training. I don't think there's any way you can teach people how to be passionate about what they do. I mean, that, that, that directly, that urges them directly from one's center. And uh, some people have that capacity, a great many people have that capacity, but some don't. I, one of the great clues is, is there some subject that you're really passionate about? I mean, there are people who look at photographs and say, oh, I get it. That freezes time and it tells stories that aren't present. If, oh, man, God, what a great art. And other people fall into books. Everyone on this panel, I think, read like a demon from childhood on because it was somehow mysterious, deep, thrilling, you know, uh, it, was, it was both an answer and a, an ongoing adventure. Um, I certainly uh, felt that way all through my youth and uh, early manhood, and I still kind of feel it, <laughs> except it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more used to it, and I'm, I'm way more used to the, to the experience of making that stuff up myself. But that is always an adventure. You know, sometimes a painful, rocky adventure, and other times uh, a, a trip to heaven on a fast boat, you know? I mean, I, <laughs> I sometimes make a conscious effort to say to myself, I think that I'm the luckiest person in the world. Yeah. Because my passion is also my, the way that I earn my living. And it, the pleasure of it, the joy of it never ran out entirely it's it's still sometimes uh y you know woody allen said 80 percent of success is just showing up and that's true that's true and i sit down and i do it and some days i don't really want to i yeah. sit down around eight o'clock and i work until about noon and then at some point almost every day something happens where you say to yourself it's really it's good this is really i, I got something hot here this yeah. is really hot and i'm gonna ride it like a pony yeah, you know, that's right. so, but Peter is absolutely a hundred percent right. You can't teach passion. You just <laughs> have to kind of wait, and and you find out what it is that that you love, and then you have the. Uh, the yeah. I think that talent goes with passion. I think they feed each other. Uh, I mean, so in that case, I'd be a great musician. You know, unfortunately, well, yeah, you got a point. I there. never I could play the saxophone, yeah. but but in in. It, it, as Steve was talking, it occurred to me that sometimes you can take the passion you feel for some other art and seek its values in what you do. If it's expressivity, if, if it's um, expressionism, if it's, you know, subtlety, you, 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 you can turn it, you can use your own tools. Yeah. To everything, I, everything I wrote in Revival about rock and roll is about writing, really. It's what I knew about yeah. Um, was there a book that you read as a child that still resonates with you today? Lord of the Flies by William Golding. You read that as a child? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit, yes, I was 12. 12, wow. At the age I, of the boys. I think for me it was, uh, it was Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. I remember reading it with my parents and the guy... Uh, da uh, is it David Balfour that goes? He goes walking up the stairs in the dark. The guy, his his evil step uncle or whatever, sends him up the stairs in the dark. And then at the top of the stairs, there's nothing, nothing else. If he goes a step farther, he falls off. And I remember uh -huh. just being so entranced by the whole, by the whole thing, wanting to live in there. I'm trying to think. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, there are so many, so many. I don't know. I am. Um, I just watched um, Lena Dunham's uh, little documentary that she made about Hillary Knight, the guy who illustrated Eloise. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, this, this is me. Like, how did I not make this movie? Like, yes, Eloise. Like, I mean, I feel like my, my mother and I, like, I still say things like tissue boxes make very good hats. You know, just like all the time. Like, it just comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? Who said that? And I'm like, Eloise said mm -hmm. that. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what I, happens in Eloise? Does she just live in the hotel and have fun? Yeah, yeah. Is that what the story is? yeah. Yes, until she becomes a drug addict, discovers the monster in the closet, and gets eaten alive. Sid <laughs> <laughs> <very> vicious. <laughs> very Sid vicious. <laughs> um, I've been trying to comb through memory, I've, and I have no trouble 
re remembering the books that made the biggest impact on me when I was very young. One is, it, it's a, a lousy book, but I read it when I was like 12, and it changed my little world. It was called Slan by A.E. Van Vogt. You ever yeah, read that? Yeah, I did, yeah. It's a really goofy piece of science fiction. On and on, Coral Prowl. That's yeah. the first sentence. <laughs> on Coral Prowl. There you go. Uh, A.E. Van Vogt at his Great, best. There you are. And, and so I, for, a, for two or three years after that, I was just mad about science fiction until I was 15 and I walked into the library at the boys school I went to and I looked for the biggest book I could fattest book I could find and I got a book called Of Time and the River by Thomas Wolfe and it was exactly the right age in exactly the right era it's a book about a very sensitive tall uh, a boy who's convinced that he might some days be quite handsome and, and uh, really wants to be a writer, is a writer, talks about writing endlessly with his friends, and is misunderstood <laughs> by the whole world, apart from one or two uh, very sensitive uh, lads. And so I thought, oh, this book is great. This book is about me. <laughs> and um, there's not, you know, that, that tends to speak to a boy. Uh, so I, after that, I read a hell of a lot of Thomas Wolfe. And then I just read the books that Thomas Wolfe recommended in his books and it just led me forward. It's very nice to meet you. Name is Charles, and speaking of which, I picked up The Stand when I was eight and read through Talisman the first time when I was 10, right. giving a fun <laughs> household. Go oh, you. Yeah, oh, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. And I've been thinking, with well, with you in the Rock Bomb Remainders with Amy Tan and Dave Barry, I'm, I'm honestly intrigued with you and music, especially with your friendship with the great Warren Zevon. I'm curious, did you and Warren ever collaborate at some point on each other's work? And in addition to that, the Crimson King from the Talisman series, was that influenced by what I think it is? And all of you, what are your musical influences in your work? Hey, good question. That's a great. Well, uh, Warren and I never collaborated. Uh, he, he told me interesting stuff. I can remember one, one time when we were playing and... Uh, we were rocking out to something or other, and mm. he's yelling at me from the stage, and and so I went, I worked my way over to him, and what he was saying was, "Play like Keith," <laughs> and, and I'm like, I could never play like <laughs> Keith Richard. He said, "No," and he he got real low, and so I got real low with the guitar. And <laughs> so, you know, you could say that Warren kind of taught me how to rock, but I've I, I've been a rock and roll fan my whole life, ever since I heard uh, Jared Lee Lewis do a whole lot of shaking going didn't, on. Didn't you, he has, that, he has that song where he mentions the kingdom of the spiders, didn't you get him, you know, didn't he have a headache one day and you told him, he asked you what was on, or you told him what was on, and that ended up He on said on? that he had headache movies, Warren did, Warren Zevon said. One of them was uh, mm. Kingdom of the Spiders, and the other one was Empire of the Ants. Oh, <laughs> so we went into his room because he oh, had yeah. a headache, and we watched these movies, and later he did write a song about that, but we never... Collaborated on a song. I think he, he collaborated with Carl Hyacin, the writer, with some songs and stuff. But uh, yeah. as far as, you know, All Hail the Crimson King, yeah, I, I don't know. There is an artist named King Crimson. But, uh, yeah, see, but that really wasn't the basis of it that I know of. But it might have clicked in there somewhere. I just thought that was a cool name for a bad guy, the Crimson King. <laughs> a little melodramatic, but hey, you know. Other musical influences? Oh, man. Anybody and everybody. Jesus, I, I can't even begin, you know, to, to go there. I just, uh, I love the music. The music makes me bigger, carries me away, and it, it weaves its way in and out of the books because it's been a big part of my life. And Owen has been giving me uh, the needle just lately about my disco face, because <laughs> you know, uh, he asked me you know, about what was the record I, I, I most regretted buying. <laughs> and I, said, I texted him this this one yeah, afternoon. Yeah. I said it was, a, a, I bought Lip Sync, uh, who had a song called Funky Town. Uh -huh. and, uh, but I just love disco and I love techno to this day. And, and uh, you know, I got into a, into a fight with a kid in college one time because I wrote some derogatory things about blood, sweat, and tears, and he came up to me after a play rehearsal and said, blood, sweat, and tears is the greatest group in the world, and I was drunk, and I said, fuck blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> so he knocked me down, and <laughs> I got a fan over there on that side, yeah, I'm liking it, man. 
<laughs> uh, when Steve and I were working away on guy. Black House, we each had our own record that we put on when it was our turn to write uh, as we were doing the ending. And Steve's record was unforgettable. It was Electric Avenue by Eddie Grant. Yeah. <laughs> and I listened to Electric Avenue by Eddie Grant like a hundred million times. And there was one effect that Eddie uh, succeeded in pulling off, which, which was sort of a large boinging uh, <laughs> sound. And Steve said, wait, wait, here it comes, here it comes. That's a diving board. Just wait. <laughs> So uh, I remember you saying that you couldn't believe that one of the lyrics in that song was "Deep in my heart, I abhor you," <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, you know, a That's statement of honesty from a guy who was working too hard to support a family that was too big. But hey, <laughs> you know, you go in bareback, you have to pay the consequences. <laughs> An excellent lesson for the students. Absolutely. <laughs> How about you guys? If you want to play, yeah. you got to pay. <laughs> yeah. Owen, oh, Emma? Uh, I remember with my, my first book, I, I had a similar experience. I, was, I, I played Wings Greatest Hits mm. all the time, which I don't even like that much, but I just it just felt like the right thing to listen to, and, and my wife was ready to kill me by the time I was done. She was like, if I hear, <laughs> you know, man, we was lonely one more time, <laughs> man, you're going to be lonely. <laughs> but, uh... I went through a through. love affair with Mambo Number no. Five, oh. one book, and Tabby was ready to kill me. <laughs> what were you writing when you were listening to Mambo Number no. Five? Quite a bit. I don't remember. <laughs> Several books, but, but I bet you can still sing the song. Pretty much, but I'm not going to sing it here. <laughs> <laughs> Emma. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's funny. Like my dad, you know, Owen was talking about the sound, like how he knew his dad was writing, which was like you hear the Ramones. For for me, it was either jazz or opera, usually jazz, and that's how I knew my dad was in his office and working. Um, and and so loud. I mean, so so loud always, so you could hear it really in the whole house. Yeah, I really <laughs> really think so. Um, but I have, I don't know, I, maybe it's like my own little form of rebellion that like I, I can't listen to anything when I write. Like I need, I need, quite, I mean I can, you know, I'm not going to like shoot a bird out of a tree if it's like tweeting at me or whatever. <laughs> but um, like I don't need like a soundproof chamber, but, um, but I, I can't listen to music, especially not music with, with lyrics just because no, I, I start listening and I just can't, I, I just lose my train of thought. Um, but the, the book that I'm working on now is about, has, has yeah. some characters in a band. Opera and opera. so I, I have been having to think about music more and I don't know, it's hard. It's hard. I don't know how people, I mean, I guess you're, you're not actually just talking about listening to music while writing. It's just music inspiring you. Um, which, which is certainly the case. Um, and there's a lot of music that I do love to listen to when I'm not writing. Um, but, but what do you listen to? Yeah. <laughs> this is the part where I listen to I admit that I listen to like three records on repeat over and over and over again um, I can relate yeah I mean so I the band that I worked for for a long time is called the Magnetic Fields um, and so yeah um, and so I, I really don't tell them this because it would be hugely embarrassing if they knew I actually liked them <laughs> um, but but I listen to them sort of constantly and they're it really smart Stephen Merritt who's the songwriter is just hilarious and so smart and um, uh, yeah so I, I listen to them a lot I listen to the Beach Boys a lot mm -hmm. um, right Right now, we're also listening to the um, the the Empire uh, soundtrack a lot. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I've got any Drip Drop fans in the audience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My son is 19 months old. The only song he knows how to sing is Drip Drop. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, I don't know. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. I really think it's not going to get any better than sitting here at St. Francis College and talking about music. I think that's about as collegiate as we can get. Uh -huh. So I want to thank everyone so much for coming out. And please join me in giving them a round of applause. Let's give it up for Book Court, for St. Francis College. Thank you guys so much for coming out. <laughs>